I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of Retention as a Service Agency, Electric. And today I'm talking with Christine Rousseau, the uh, principal at Retail Creative and Consulting Agency. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show, Christine. Thanks, Brandon. I'm Gen X. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many. What's the new one? I think there's Alpha. Alpha? Yeah. I don't know if it's Gen Alpha or just referred to as Alpha. I have Gen Z children. Um and I'm in retail technology. So I champion Gen Z technology all over, literally all over the retail ecosystem, um, particularly in brick and mortar to Mm -hmm. make sure that several new iterations of quote unquote shopping are available. And I love that. I love how Gen Z is driving transformation. Who's, uh, I want to know who's responsible for coming up with the names. Like who picks Gen Z, who picks Gen Alpha? That, that would be a well fascinating job. A comes after Z, but we never really had, you had the greatest generation, which is the boomers, right? Mm-hmm. Or the greatest generation, then the boomers. And then Gen Z, Gen X came around, which is mine, but we were like the smallest cohort. We were just this like unnamed, small, under the radar, like kind of group. And I think that's where the lettering system came about. But I think the job has officially moved to the same people who name hurricanes. Um, It's a whole new (laughs) division in our, in our world. Um, So, yeah. So I think those guys are pretty busy. Yeah, naming generations and naming hurricanes. Fascinating. I just missed the uh, the millennial cutoff, so by about two years, I think. I um, see. So I think it worked out well because I feel like millennials have a have a certain connotation that's associated with them, though. So do Gen Z as well. So. Well, I've, you would be a zillennial. That's like an actual thing. Oh. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. I want to start using that. You're a zillennial. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so before, we, um, before we jump into things, can you give everybody just like a quick uh, background on on yourself? Yeah, sure. So I used to be in charge of building retail stores for big American designer led brands around the world. So I did that for J. Crew when there was like the original founders working there, and some other American brands and. Um, so very, very like, you know, like, I mean, I'm a licensed general contractor. So it was turnkey. I did real estate site selection through to literally here, guys, move in. Very, very physical retail. But what that turned into and, and led to this uh, role that I play in re- in digital retail is was to always be on the lookout. What was happening 10 years out? Because they were always 10-year leases technologically for in-store, right? So um, there were various things happening. And and these were the days of like geofencing and things like that. I mean, if we go back far enough in my um, career, you know, I put kiosks in stores to add this thing called the World Wide Web. Um, I mean, it, it was always like, how do we introduce what the consumer is doing into physical retail? And lo and behold, that's still what I do today. It's crazy. It's totally different. I don't build stores, but there are plenty of physical, there's physical retail out there that Mm. came out of the pandemic. Like, wait, what's going on? Why can they buy now, pay later online? And then they walk into our store and we don't offer it. Or maybe they have to like scan a QR code. Is this, it's crazy. No way. It has to be seamless and frictionless, just like everything is online and digitally. How, how many retail shops would you say have a like disconnected uh online and in-store experience still most most Most. yeah i mean think about it you want to go so for example i work with 
college bookstores a lot because I am spearheading bringing tap and pay digital service to this heavy concentration of Gen Z customers. It's not more heavily isolated than at a college bookstore on campus. I mean, I think we can agree on that. That's very generational. It is the most homogeneous crowd. You're, You're mostly dealing with that age range. So the stores that are there, a lot of them are very, very old, not as old as the university, but like 50, 60 years old. And they're trying to evolve. They had their lunch stolen by Amazon, boo-hoo, no, this, that. They're pivoting. They're bringing in more digital uh, general merchandise. But the thing is, you go up to the cash register and you have to like take out your wallet and put your card in. And that honestly feels so dated. They don't take Venmo, for example. But if you went online, you could pay with Venmo. So that's one example of just blurring the lines between what's happening in store and what's happening digitally. Got it. I think I still see a lot of opportunity there. Um, I like one of the merchants that I shop from uses Shopify's like POS and their e-commerce platform. And so it really is just a substantially better customer experience for me, the ability to go into store and they already know everything that I've ordered online. They know my sizes. I can exchange very easily. My loyalty points are used, utilized across both. Um, but I think, and but correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like from a technology perspective, the POS solutions are far more robust from the players that don't really have an e-commerce solution. And then the e-commerce solution, like Shopify is very robust, but then their POS is, is kind of lacking. Is You're, that you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's very generally speaking, very top line. You're right. But mm-hmm. what you also want to think about is stores that came about bef- and didn't did a website so much later are have what, you know, what the industry calls legacy POS. And it's just old fashioned, right? And yet changing your POS is one of the worst, worst <laughs> things. That was going to be my next question because a migration of a website, it can be pretty terrible, especially if there's like subscriptions involved. But um, is POS really a, a nightmare? Absolute nightmare. Migration of any kind is a nightmare. I mean, let's just call it what it is. So it is definitely one of the things that is put off for as long as possible. So then you have legacy POS, whatever, um, sorry, uh, website. And then you have, of course, digital retail. So like you could have other forms of non-store retail, like live selling or whatever it is, right? Um, so now it's, it's really just not bifurcated one or the other. We can keep it that way for discussion purposes and simplification, but that's where like all this, all of this technology and all of these founders have tried to create this, like, kind of like fix, fix the connection between legacy and, and your e and create operating systems. And there's some really good stuff out there because, and they're built on the fact that people are not going to migrate. So yeah. there are some really, 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 really good integrating solutions that 100% improve um, the performance year over year. I mean, there's some real game changers out there. Uh, so, yeah. What, what do you think you gotta, the... You got to do... Is it just a matter of time until there's sort of a a consolidation of, of players and it is more of a commerce solution where e-commerce and POS is, is sort of being jointly offered, or do you think there will still be this sort of fragmentation moving forward for a while? Okay. So there's right now a ton of consolidation going on in general um, across all retail technology, because a lot of smaller businesses are not making it. So they have to sell to bigger companies. So, you might see it because of that. Um, yet the big divide when it comes to 
why we're here is, um, how do I want to say this? Paying for what you can afford as you start and as you grow. And what happens is you get caught stuck, right? So Uh there's a, there's a college near where I live. And the truth is they have square as their POS, like not good. It's such a, you pay nothing, but you pay, you pay. Look, ultimately you pay, but Mm. you think you're not paying and you end up paying more and you limit your options. So um, a lot, I mean, if we're talking very small businesses and this is a college, I wouldn't expect it from them, but people make sometimes short term term decisions um, and even big brands kind of get caught as well. I don't think anyone really, it's just been so much change, right? So the real play is to figure out how to not make these major migrations and make them speak to each other. So Mm -hmm. think of it as a tech stack. So you have like case of of a thousand nations, a bunch of tech stacks connecting all these things that around each of the ecosystems. Well, I'm going to do your retargeting marketing and I'm going to do this and then I'm going to connect you here, but I only go this far. And then I'm going to connect this, this far and then this. So, you know, it's been a little overwhelming for the retailer brand to kind of ha- have this full tech stack. Mm-hmm. What's happened is, as I said, along this thousand, it, there's a lot of consolidation and people are going out into areas they didn't do before. So where you had a thousand solutions, maybe you'll have 500 and then maybe you'll have 400. And then maybe the big guys themselves incorporate some so that, and then it all merges into one big thing. You see, you see visually what I'm kind of trying to yeah. say. I mean, I think it, there's parallels to like the Shopify ecosystem and just e-commerce in general in terms of there being like a thousand different solutions for everything. But then uh, w- one of the biggest differentiators is how it integrates with your other solutions. So now we're at a point where I feel like the the best in class players in the e-commerce space, whether it's for email or SMS or product reviews or cross sells and upsells, like they all integrate with one another. Um, what is becoming interesting now in, in that space is they are starting to encroach upon one another. So they're, I, I don't really see a whole lot of innovation necessarily happening over the next couple of years as um email platforms start releasing reviews products and reviews products start releasing survey and quiz products. And they start to sort of walk on each other's feet here. And it's going to be interesting because they all raised a fair amount of money. Um, They all need to expand to meet their uh, investors' expectations. But at what point do the integration stopped being supported or is there a world in which um, you sort of need to choose one or the other because the whole, the whole talk track on this point has been you like go best in class with each solution and then they integrate with one another. But what happens if everybody becomes like a hub spot now where your, your platform does literally everything I'd say at like a seven out of 10 versus doing everything at a 10 out of a 10 with a bunch of different solutions. Mostly people are going to take the seven out of 10 because you won't, you want to have as few vendors as possible. It's like a generally accepted best practice. Mm. Also what you're describing when people are not innovating, but they're iterating, right? They're just adding on little things, little changes. We're adding on known things versus new things and, mm. cons- and consolidation. These are the kind of things we see at the very huge enterprise level where, for example, Salesforce is helping their clients go into the metaverse. So is Deloitte. So is Accenture. And I'm just like, what? Um, Okay. But the reason why, and this this is an analogy for what you're describing is the reason why is, first of all, they've decided they're not going to wait and see. There's enough enough momentum to say, okay, this is real and we need to be a part of it. 
so that our customers that hire us for our 10 out of 10 service, our best service, Mm -hmm. don't go somewhere else because we don't offer it. And then while they're there at this other, you know, it's like cheating at this other place, like, oh my God, this is so much better. I want all my stuff to go over here. Mm -hmm. They want to keep them in their worlds. Like they literally want to close the windows, draw the blinds, like, oh, what, what other service providers? I don't see anyone. That's what you're seeing at the Shopify with the Shopify giants too. They want to keep adding things to keep them from maybe trying something else and liking it too much and then giving those people a chance or maybe those other providers offer them some sick financial like, hey, uh, a year for free or something, an enticement because the customer acquisition costs are through the roof. And people are desperate and they're doing crazy things to get customers. Yeah, I feel like when I look at our e-commerce uh, partners, they're, they're really all fundamentally competing with one another, even though now it might not be obvious at all because they do two completely separate things. But at some point, they're all, and you've I've seen it a lot over the last three months, they're just encroaching upon one another. So it really comes down to who's starting from the, from the strongest position. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that has to do with um, how good the tool is, but also what the tool is. So your email marketing platform is a hell of a lot stickier than, I don't know, your your product reviews on site or your quiz builder on site. Like one is a CRM with all of your customer data. Another is more of a, a, a feature for, for your website. So it would be a lot easier for that email tool to go encroach upon others than it would be for... Uh, quiz tool to do to do the reverse 100 percent. that's you're going to see consolidation mm-hmm. yeah so as it comes to customer acquisition sort of issues that brands have been facing um what how, how has retail evolved with with that are you seeing more investment into retail because it feels like there's been wild swings like with covid obviously everybody stopped shopping in store for like a solid six months. And then people were craving the in-person experiences. And now brands are like, at least on our end, it seems like they're, they're taking the retail opportunity and, and giving it a closer look. It might be cheaper now to have that real estate footprint. It actually might be a good source of customer acquisition for them. What are some of the things you're seeing there? So when you say retail, you mean brick and mortar. When I say retail, yeah. I say any form of buying. Yes. You know, brick and mortar. But so for brick and mortar, well, let's just look back. Like e-commerce was the endless aisle and without having to have a huge stock room and there was no rent to pay. Yay. Oh my God. It was the greatest thing ever. And, and, and it's not that, as we know, it's endless hours to get endless aisles, payroll hours to get that information in and keep it updated. And then the customer acquisition cost. What a spiral downward, man. I don't know who started it with the first 15%. Give us your email. We hate them. Okay. Because like, what are we doing? What did you guys do? I don't even know what this is. I have no idea what this is. My least favorite is the like, take, take 50% off your first subscription order. Um, Because then it's even worse. Then you're forcing people into subscription and. There's, it's been a quick race down to the bottom of, of how, how cheap or even free you can make that first order online to just try and get a customer. Absolutely. And there is no loyalty. Okay. And what do they think people are doing? I mean, they have multiple emails, they have multiple addresses, like there's, they're gaming the system, but that's not what you ask. You ask, what are people doing in brick and mortar? as far as customer acquisition. So let's go back. I was making a point. Oh, the rents, the rents for brick and mortar. Oh, the payroll. Oh, this or that, blah, blah, blah. So expensive. Well, you're right. Now brick and mortar is actually seen in many, many ways less expensive Mm. than running an e-com site. Um, But it's not really, it's very hard to sort of say this one's better than the other. The bottom line is, uh, if you're serious about it, it's all on the table, right? Including those non-e-com site 
digital selling formats like social selling as an example. So, or even the metaverse, right? The whole spiel go to where your customer is. But before you go running to where your customer is, the first thing is like, well, where are they? What do they do? Like what's going on? Um, and really like look at it from a top line. How can we engage with them? Then fill in the blanks and and the technology to support it. So um, you're right. A lot of people are, there, there was a lot of vacancy also with the pandemic. So there was, you know, a kind of lower bar to entry. And I don't, I don't know about that right now. I think it's all come back quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, if I were to start a brand right now, I would not spend any money in online ads. I would try and find uh, a small brick and mortar footprint that I could get started with, but then leverage my understanding of online and, and e-commerce to funnel people through that store into the online experience because totally well you could do like, that through sms marketing for example if they're in the store and they want it they like it it's there of that mindset boom right away bam right over there over i actually was talking to somebody um last weekend at, at shopify unite about qr codes and an activation they did at a at a, at a pop-up event where they had qr codes sort of littered throughout and you'd scan it and it would give you some sort of reward that was time sensitive for that location, but also opted you into SMS marketing. So, and because of the fact that the, the POS system and the e-commerce system were all integrated, when that person would go and check out, you'd know what SMS phone number or what phone number it was through. And so now they can remarket to all of these people and they know what they purchased at the event and it can really start to start to scale. Um, I, I've heard, I'm, a, I'm still a fan of QR codes. I think people like them. Um, I think they have a lot of engagement and I think that they had their moment because of the whole pandemic thing. Yeah. They, were, they were not a thing before that. They were around well before it, but I think people are curious to, to see what's behind the curtain for sure. The other thing is there's a little bit a teeny weeny weeny little bit rebirth of third party selling, like wholesaling. Um, as long as you negotiate to get the customer information, it's mm -hmm. a pretty low cost way to get your product out without taking on all of the financial risk. So for example, if you're a, I don't know, a sweatshirt, right? You know, you have your own sweatshirt company brand that you're building. You can sell in other stores like a surf shop that's existing and they're paying the rent and you're not on the lease and you know you do six month activations etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. it's definitely a way to drive sales now as far as data goes it gets a little more tricky unless you have your own checkout within your own little shop and shop and i will tell you that there's a ton of very easy untethered checkout technology that they could do they could even use that square white you know swipe um, and then, you know, they pay like a percentage of sales back to the store. So that is a very easy way to be physical mm -hmm. without high risk, high dollar expense about the unknown. Uh, and that's something if I were telling a client, you know, what should I do? That's something I would highly, highly recommend. I love collaborations like that. Yeah, especially if you can align with a brand that is going to have pretty much similar customers, um, but yeah. you don't have competing products, then it's, it, it's basically like all these things that we're trying to do now, it feels like are to replicate the level of targeting that uh, like Facebook ads and the like used to be able to give because um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody, had, somebody made a comment to me about how, Three years ago, it was totally plausible to start a direct-to-consumer brand that had an extremely targeted niche. Like, let's say, I don't know, paleo mothers, <laughs> 35 to 42, of a certain income bracket in a certain area. And you could, you could realistically scale that to be a $25 million brand just off the back of, of Facebook ads. But now... You can't reach that same cohort anymore, that same group, 
because you don't have the ability to target them based off of other stores that they're looking at or if they're visiting their site and then and retargeting them. So really to have like an effective advertising campaign now online, it almost needs to be more broad. So as opposed to selling, I don't know, paleo, keto, chocolate chip cookies with X, Y, and Z, you, you need to just sell something that supports really more of the masses than, than those specific target groups. Sucks um, for keto people. I'm keto. <laughs> <laughs> there is no such thing as keto chocolate chips, folks. It's look at the, look at the gross carbs doesn't exist. The whole, uh, the, the whole net, the whole net carb uh, debate is, is, is fascinating to me. Yeah, uh, I don't participate. I just go net carbs. No, it's like, not. it's, it's not, it's like, you're either in it or you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, I, I agree. So think about, okay, you freed up all that money. What are you going to do with it? Right. Mm-hmm. How can you put it to work? I think focusing on the customer experience more and more is something that brands are like trying to figure out. And it's, it's fascinating to me how little attention was being paid to like what happens after order number five or what happens after order number 10. Um, even though like one of my favorite things to do whenever we start with any client is just go into their Clavio account or whatever and create a segment of everybody who's ordered 10 times or more. And even for some of the smaller brands, you're looking at 500 people, a thousand people. Um, and they're, they're not communicated with in any way that's different than the person placing order number two or order number three. There's just so much opportunity to create a personalized experience. And it just takes a little bit of, of, of time and effort. And, resourcing that area like so much time i feel like the the norm before was just to try and take as much money as possible and dump it into that top of funnel versus really investing in in what a retention experience looks like you definitely nailed it i am an obsessor over segmentation i think it's such a powerful way the powerful way to uh, communicate, manage, and um, keep engaged your customer. And a lot of it, I mean, the, the reason why people don't do it is because they don't understand, okay, they built a brand. So they're brand builders, they're creative. Maybe they're operators, mm-hmm. maybe they're finance people. I don't know. But the one thing you have to be to segment, if you're using your email information and purchasing information is a psychologist. You have to think how they're thinking. Oh my God, I love this. So you go in and you could sort by date or you could sort by date of purchase. You could sort by amount of purchase. I could tell you if if I sort something, I can tell you exactly why they were buying without even seeing, um, without even knowing for sure. I'm like, that's a teacher's gift. That, that gift right there was for their kid's teacher. I know that. So what does that mean? People think gift giving is just holiday. But if you're in the... In, in, in a brand, a multi-brand, and you have, you know, there's so many more gift giving holidays and that end of year, that like May to June period, people need to get their teacher gifts. And it's like horrible because you don't know what to get them. So you get them a Starbucks gift card and it's like, really? So guess what? An email pops in with that great $25 thing that you know the teacher will want. And by the way, it's a little bit of competition to be the best gift, not the most expensive, but the best gift. Let that come from an email because you know that that person's going to be looking for something. Yeah. I love it. I love segmentation. You're on the right path there. Yeah. Even little things like going into the holiday season, getting our clients to have a post-purchase survey question that just asks, was this a gift or not? Um, Because if it was, then we can obviously go into a separate like email and SMS communication flow. Like, why don't you purchase for yourself or whatever it may be. But if it was a gift, then there's a recipient on that end. And how do we start to nurture and, and create a relationship with them? Um, so some of the things you can just get from the first party data and then other things, once you know how you want to personalize the experience, you can go and get it by quite literally just asking and, and getting the zero party data directly from the source. 
you know, that's not a bad idea. Um, kind of like, would, you know, would you, would, would they share that information? Is that what you're saying? You would ask, you know, who got the gift and can we communicate with them? We have your permission, give us their email. Is that what you're saying? Well, even simpler than that, just was this a gift or not? Because mm -hmm. if, if it was, mm -hmm. then we can immediately bucket them into sort of that gift giving group, but we can also ask them, oh, why don't you like buy something for yourself? Here's, here's a thank you for gifting this to somebody. And it's like spreading the word about our brand. Yeah. Just getting as much information as possible on a customer to be able to, to do that segmentation and personalization. If you can't get that from information, I'm telling you the numbers speak to you. I know that's, you know, it, it re they really do. Mm. They really do. You really, but you're right. People don't devote the time to it, but there's a lot of information to unlock there. And it's like, how do you even get started if you, because if you, if you don't have a million customers, then the more granular your segmentation gets, the less sort of optimal it's going to be because it doesn't really matter. You, you can't get any real insights if you only have a group of 50 people. You can't run a test on a group of 50 people. You know, there's no control. There's no statistical significance. You can make assumptions, but um, there's a very simple sort of walk before you run things that you can do when it comes to segmentation just to prove out its its merits. <laughs> I, um, I, I agree, but I like using the segmentation also. It tells you where they purchased. It tells yeah. you how they came to you. So one of the things I obsess over is, okay, look at all of these, I call it the gateway. How, and then you, you create these archetypes. So you have like, you want people who are coming to you through the um, new arrivals. So those are like, that's a certain, we love that customer, right? If they came through the new arrivals and bought full price, we love that customer. And they get a certain message. And then there's this, the seasonal sale customer that comes through maybe a promotion. Mm -hmm. And we see them and they're like, they've been eyeing this item and now it's 20% off and they'll go for it. And we love that customer too. And then twice a year, we see a whole new huge set of customers coming in through the hard markdown 70% off come in and we love those customers too and if you can build out your assortment where you still can make margin on those people you actually have not one store you have like seven stores because you're selling to the segments based on their archetype and how they like to buy what astounds me is that people businesses and brands are think everyone is sitting at home waiting for new arrivals to come from their store when, you know, maybe they're tight on budget. Maybe it's this. So it's like, oh, new arrivals, sale, new arrivals, sale. It's, it's not creative enough and you're not using your information enough um, to really understand how people like to buy from you. So that all comes down to segmentation. When, I mean, touching on uh, brick and mortar a little bit more, what, what's like one thing or one trend that you think anybody listening to this should should be aware of that is exciting or relevant, whatever it may be. Okay, this isn't a trend, it's a strategy. So I like to think of things as fad, trend, or strategy. This is a strategy. And what, what you're gonna wanna do if you're considering it is you're gonna wanna start with a, a percentage rent deal, no rent. In other words, if that space is available to you at a percentage rent deal, that means everything you sell, the landlord gets a percent of that versus you pay to be there and you make no sales and you still pay to be there. And those deals can be done. You'd be surprised how much those deals can be done. So mm -hmm. that would be a strategy. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll put in the lease Oh, we also want to include your online sales and then you strike it and you get it out of there because that's not going to go towards that percentage. That space has nothing to do with it. So um, that would sort of be my recommendation. And it's, it's a strategy bundled in a trend because those types of deals are offered more or less depending on trend. 
Unfortunately, right now I'm hearing that the that the retail real estate market is very strong, so you, it might be harder to find those deals, but also maybe not. So they ebb and flow in the quantity based on macroeconomic um, situation. Got it. That makes sense. That's a nice little provision that they try to throw in there about taking your online sales. <laughs> They do. They do. And what's funny is um, one thing that you, that'll be hard to capture is they don't, they don't discount when you get returns from online. So it's a channel now. So, you know, it's, you have to really pay attention and watch. So, yeah. Just like with any contract, there's there's always something underlying. Yes. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, it's fascinating to sort of get your, your take on things, especially from more of a, a brick and mortar perspective. Um, before we hop off, though, can you let everybody know like where they can find you online? Yeah, sure. That, that sounds great. So I actually spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Again, that's, you know, maybe commensurate with where I am in my career. And you can just search Christine Russo. My agency is Retail Creative and Consulting Agency. And that's R-C-C-A. I think that if they want to DM me on LinkedIn and start to see the educational information that I post out there, and it links to my YouTube, a lot of metaverse stuff on my YouTube. So it could be really interesting for people to start to think about a year from now, like, what is this? Do I want to do this? What's everyone else doing? I really applaud curiosity. And my platform is Learn With Me. So if they want to learn all kinds of things and all different types of technologies going on, they can follow um, What Just Happened. It's a podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify. What Just Happened by Christine Russo. And that's it. Okay, awesome. I'll make sure that that we include that in, in the show notes. I like the, the Learn With Me sort yeah. of mindset. Um, yeah. We're constantly learning. Uh, and if you're not, then you will be left behind, maybe with some legacy POS technology too. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Um, thank you everybody for listening. As always, you can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. Uh, and until next time. Okay.